awards, the best, this, the best, best, best bowler. So these are all on objective basis, now. So True. Has to be some, some objective mark. Scoring, scoring, yes, scoring, scoring system. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Scoring system. Correct. Well, it is now right seven o'clock. Raja, Doctor Murli, are you ready, sir? I'm ready. I'm ready. Okay, fine. After your talk is mine. Yes. It is up to Raja to decide. After your talk, let there be some interaction. Then after mine, there will be more interactions. Sure. What for Raja feels? Another chairperson will join in between. <clears throat> okay, Raja. Raja, please. So anyone will give us a count or shall I just start? Technical team. Sir, you uh, can start. Good now, evening, sir. sir. Uh, I would like Good evening, sir. I would like to uh, give a brief introduction, uh, uh, post which you can uh, start with. Okay. Is there any problem in uploading the slide, Shikta? <clears throat> Hello, am I audible? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes, yes. Yes, sir, I'm starting. Good evening, all of you. I welcome you all to our fourth session of Palmocon 2020. And our today's topic is based on pulmonary vasculopathy. To talk upon it, we have our eminent speakers with us. But first, we would like to introduce, and I would like to take the opportunity to introduce our chairpersons for today. First, we have Dr. Raja Dhor, who is who is an eminent pulmonologist and presently associated with uh, Fortis Hospital, Kolkata. He is the head of the department over there. He is the national representative for the ERS and the director of research and education, National Allergy Asthma Bronchitis Institute, Kolkata. And next we have Dr. Rito Broto Mitro, who is also an eminent pulmonologist and presently he is associated with Iris Multispeciality Hospital, Kolkata. He has an experience of more than 10 years in this field. And he was also associated as the faculty department of pulmonology in SSK and IPJ. And now I would uh, request our chairperson, Dr. Raja Dhar, to kindly proceed over the session. Thank you. And over to you, sir. Thank you very much. Um, absolute pleasure to be here. Uh, Parthoda, thank you very much for having me. It's always a pleasure to be in a part of Palmocon. We've had it as a physical meeting year in and year out for as long as I can remember. And we are having it as a virtual meeting in the middle of the pandemic. So kudos to you and the entire team for hosting this meeting. Today we are at module four and we are here to talk about pulmonary vasculopathy. For this, the first talk would be from my good friend, Dr. Murli Mohan, and he's going to speak about pulmonary hypertension, basic facts, and what is new. Dr. Murli Mohan is in internal medicine and pulmonology at Mazumdar Shaw Medical Center in Bangalore. He is the author of several research publications and projects. His area of interest, as we all know it, is in pulmonary hypertension. So I cannot think of anyone more appropriate than Dr. Murli Mohan to speak on this topic. Dr. Murli Mohan, all yours. Thank you, Raja. Uh, as usual, you know, it's, it's great to be here. I have participated in Palmocon earlier, as you said, physically. And of course, it's an absolute pleasure to be with all of you, uh, especially Dr. Partha Bhattacharya, who is an old friend. I mean, we, he's not old, but, uh, you know, we go back <laughs> quite some time. So I would like to start without, you know, wasting any more time. 
And I'm going to stick to the basics here. I'm not going to make it a very long talk. Initially, it was supposed to be only 15 minutes. Um, Dr. Bhattacharya has asked me to extend it a little further. So I've gone on to add on one more topic, but very, very brief. <clears throat> Yeah, so let's start with just the basic facts and what is new in this area. So I'll be, I bring you greetings from Narayan Tridhyalaya, the Mazumdar Shaw Medical Center. These are the two buildings in the main campus, but we have over 28, in fact, I think 32 centers countrywide. Uh, moves up and down a little, we get a new center, we close an old center. So that's where we are in Bangalore, which is really the heartbeat of the Narayan Tridhyalaya chain. My conflict of interest statement, I have been a speaker and received grants for particip or participate in advisory boards and lectures for companies that do manufacture pulmonary hypertension medications, but I'm not promoting any particular product today. So when I ask myself what are basic facts, it really is what must we know? So I'm going to stick to what I think all of us have to absolutely know in the field of pulmonary hypertension. So what are these? I'm going to speak, be speaking on what is pulmonary hypertension, including its definition. I'm going to talk about how it's classified and how we grade the severity. And at all points, I'll be talking about why should we know these facts. I'm going to spend some time on how do we treat pulmonary arterial hypertension, because a lot of people use these drugs without really knowing how to use them. But I'm going to be speaking only on pulmonary artery hypertension, Dr. Partha Bhattacharya is going to be talking on how pulmonary hypertension is treated in COPD. I'm going to talk about a few recent updates, especially in the aftermath of the COVID pandemic, and leave with a few closing remarks on CTEF. So what is pulmonary hypertension? We define it basically like we define systemic hypertension by numbers. And pulmonary hypertension is defined by a mean pulmonary artery pressure. I'll remind you, it's the mean pulmonary artery pressure greater than 20 millimeters of mercury, and this is defined at rest. The old definition, including at exercise, has been removed. So now it's purely at rest, a greater than 20 millimeters of mercury being pulmonary artery pressure. And we recognize two types of pulmonary hypertension, pre-capillary, where the pulmonary artery occlusion pressure or the pulmonary artery wedge pressure or the pulmonary capillary pressure, all meaning the same thing, is less than 15 millimeters of mercury. And there's a post-capillary pulmonary hypertension where the pulmonary artery occlusion pressure is greater than 15 millimeters of mercury. So essentially what you do at right heart cath is you take your Swan-Gans catheter, advance it till it can go no further. Now it is wedged in the smallest divisions of pulmonary arteries, which is why it's called the pulmonary artery wedge pressure, which is now the preferred term. And if this pressure is going to be truly reflective of the left atrial pressure, it basically is reflecting what is happening in the left heart. So when you have a left heart cause for pulmonary hypertension, the pulmonary artery occlusion pressure is going to be greater than 15 millimeters of mercury. If the problem is before the heart, that means it's in the lung or before the lung, before the pulmonary artery enters the lung or in its branches in the lung, then you get a pre-capillary pulmonary pressure, which is less than 15 millimeters. The capillary wedge pressure is less than 15 which means the pulmonary artery occlusion pressure is less than 15. And it tells you that any rise in the pulmonary artery pressure must be before the left atrium, which means it is in the lung. This will make it a little more clear. Here you have the right ventricle, which pumps in blood into the pulmonary artery, breaks up into smaller arterioles and capillaries in the lungs, then becomes the pulmonary venules and veins, which end in the left atrium. So if you have a problem anywhere here, after the lung, then you have a post-capillary hypertension, pulmonary hypertension. Whereas if it is in the lung or before the lung, then it's a pre-capillary pulmonary hypertension. So A and B refer to these pre-capillary forms, whereas the post-capillary forms are any problem in the aorta, as in systemic hypertension, which feeds back onto the left ventricle, causing left ventricular hypertrophy, left atrial enlargement because of the diastolic or the systolic failure of the left ventricle, then the pulmonary vein and pulmonary venular pressures rise. It can also happen in other conditions such as 
pulmonary capillary hemangiomatosis or pulmonary veno occlusive disease where the pulmonary veins get occluded or the pulmonary venules get occluded. So we recognize pre-capillary pulmonary hypertension, which is all the groups one, three, four, and five, and I'll come back to this. You have isolated post-capillary pulmonary hypertension, and you can have a combined pre- and post-capillary hypertension where the problem is not only in the heart, but also in the lungs. Okay, and we recognize that these belongs to group, belong to group two, which is left heart disease, and multiple causes or miscellaneous causes or multiple mechanisms, which is group five. What am I talking about when I talk about the groups? I'm talking about the latest classification of pulmonary hypertension, where we divide it into five groups based on the pathogenesis. So it's really a very logical kind of grouping of the different conditions that lead to pulmonary hypertension. Group one, properly called pulmonary arterial hypertension, is when the problem is in the pulmonary arter arteries, arterioles, or capillaries. This can be idiopathic when we, despite everything we do, are unable to find a proper etiology. And there are various other forms that properly are called group one prime or group one dash or group one dash dash, which is PAH due to PVOD or PCH and PP, uh, pulmonary, persistent pulmonary hypertension in the newborn, which occurs in the uh, pediatric age group. So we don't really look at it. A group we often see are those with associated pulmonary artery hypertension because we deal with a large number of connective tissue disorders along with rheumatologists. And of course, we deal with HIV infection and we get involved along with the gastroenterologists in portal hypertension. So this is group one. I simplify the other groups. So group one, pulmonary arterial hypertension, PAH. All the other groups are called PH. Group two, associated with left heart disease. Group three, associated with hypoxia or lung disease. And that's a group we very often see. Group four, which I'll be coming back to later, pH due to pulmonary artery obstruction. The obstruction most commonly is due to emboli, which organize, so they are called thromboemboli. And if this leads to pulmonary hypertension, group four, but you can also get obstructions due to tumor emboli. You can get it due to other things like parasitic infestations. You can get it due to a pulmonary angiosarcoma, which develops there. So there's a whole variety of things that can occlude the pulmonary arteries physically, causing pulmonary hypertension, and this is group four. And when you have something that doesn't fit neatly into any one of these groups, then we put them into group five, miscellaneous causes or multiple mechanisms. But in the latest grouping, 2019, we've decided that this shall fall into one of the other groups if that is the predominant mechanism. So if the predominant mechanism is due to lung disease, even if there are other mechanisms contributing, then it might fall into group three. That's the classification according to the pathogenesis. But we also have a functional classification or a functional class assessment, which is something you've learned from um, your third MBBS, you know, as soon as you enter the clinical side, one of the first things we were taught is how do you grade dyspnea or how do you class dyspnea? We use the NYHA classes and the WHO classes for pulmonary hypertension are very similar. If there is no activity limitation, it's group one. A slight limitation of activity with exertion, group two. When it's very marked, but the person has no symptoms at rest, then it's group three. But symptoms with any activity or even at rest is called group four or class four. So this is very important. And why is it important? Because it determines your survival according to the functional class. And you can see that a person who has functional class two has a much better survival. This is at three years than somebody who's functional class four who has symptoms at rest, whose five-year survival is not even measured on this, whose two and a half year survival roughly is about 50% or less. So the median survival in patients with class four, and if you combine class four and class three, then they have a median survival of something like 2.8 years. And something we use very often, the six minute walk distance compares very well with functional class. As you go down in functional class, your six minute walk distance goes down. This is hardly surprising, but it's a useful piece of information because we use a six minute walk distance both in cardiology and in pulmonology and in rheumatology and indeed in a variety of conditions 
because the six minute walk test is an extremely good measure of the overall physical condition of the person. So why is this helpful to us? Because a six minute walk distance is used as a surrogate for mortality. We just saw that the functional class correlates with mortality. Now we know from the other side that the six minute walk distance compares with the functional class. So the six minute walk distance in a sense is a surrogate marker for mortality and is very useful because you don't want to wait till patients die. You want to get these uh, answers on your trials earlier. So we use a six minute walk distance as a surrogate for mortality and improvements in this six minute walk distance as a surrogate for improving survival. How do we actually measure the pulmonary artery pressure? Now, the most accurate way is with right heart catheterization, but clearly the easiest way, the non-invasive way, the way associated with no mortality is to do a 2D echo. Now, the pulmonary artery pressure measured by the two methods does not always correlate perfectly. And therefore, when you're interpreting the pulmonary artery pressures as measured on a 2D echo, you have to correlate it with the history and the clinical findings. So everything is interpreted in the light of the history and the clinical findings, because these are gonna give you the pre-test uh, probability, and you use the pre-test probability to interpret the findings that you get on the echo. <clears throat> what are the normal pressures? So the right atrial pressure is between zero and four, and this varies with respiration. The right ventricular pressure is usually around 18 to 20, but can go up to 25 millimeters of mercury systolic and four millimeters of mercury diastolic. The pulmonary artery pressure is very similar. Uh, remember, these are systolic pressures, not mean pressures. The left atrial pressure is between eight and 10 millimeters of mercury. And we all know the left ventricular pressure is between 120 and zero, going up to about 10. And the aorta pressure we all know is 120 by 80. We learned that again as we entered medicine. So remember these figures, 25 and 10 for the pulmonary artery pressures, because these are figures you'll have to remember. And these are the systolic and the diastolic pressures, not the mean pressures. How do we actually use the cardiac echo to measure the pulmonary artery pressure? So what we do is we take the tricuspid valve gradient, and this needs a lot of care. If you do it in a slipshod fashion, you'll get very poor readings. So what you need to do is search very hard for what is the maximum, what is the best window to estimate the pulmonary artery pressure. Then you switch on your Doppler probe, place it across the pulmonary artery entrance, and there you get the, tri sorry, the tricuspid valve entrance, and you get the tricuspid valve regurgitation when you switch on your Doppler. If you get this gradient, you can measure that distance, the gradient is given by four times the tricuspid valve velocity squared. So V is the tricuspid valve velo gradient velocity, V. V squared times four gives you the tricuspid valve gradient. You add this to the right atrial pressure, which is usually estimated as somewhere between five and 15, typically around 10. And you use the uh, IVC diameter and how it behaves with respiration you get a greater than 50% uh, change in the diameter, the caliber of the IVC or less. And what is the diameter of the IVC? And you can therefore extrapolate this to get what is the right atrial pressure. Obviously, the higher the right atrial pressure, the greater the diameter of the IVC and the less is the respiratory excursion or the respiratory variation in the IVC. When you add the tricuspid valve gradient to the RAP, you will get the systolic pulmonary artery pressure or SPAP or uh, PASP as it's sometimes called. And most echocardiographers will give you the PASP. You have to then convert it into the mean pulmonary artery pressure because this is the important measure. Just like in the ICU, try and look at the mean uh, aortic pressure or the mean systolic pressure. Here, I'm sorry, the mean uh, systemic pressure. Here also we try to get the mean pulmonary artery pressure. And one of the formulae, there are many formulae which give this, is 0.61 into the systolic pressure, add it to two, that gives you the mean pulmonary artery pressure. There's another very important fact we need to remember, that as the right ventricle fails, obviously its ability to generate a high pressure comes down. The equivalent is when you go into shock, your systolic pressure falls, the systemic systolic pressure falls because your left ventricle is failing. Just like that, when the right ventricle fails, 
the pulmonary artery pressure may drop. So you'll get a falsely low pulmonary artery pressure. How do you recognize this? When you say, I strongly suspect this person has pulmonary artery hypertension, but the pressures given by the echo are low. You also look at what's called the TAPSI. The TAPSI uh, is the tricuspid annular plane systolic excursion. So essentially, you can understand that when your right ventricle is contracting well, vigorously, the tricuspid plane, the annulus of the tricuspid valve moves well. Normally, it moves more than 17 millimeters of mercury. However, if you have a failing right ventricle and it's hardly contracting at all, and that's what my cardiac surgeons tell me when they open up a patient with CTAV and look at the right ventricle, you know, it's just almost quivering. There's hardly any movement going in it. So the tricuspid annulus hardly moves when the tricuspid valve contracts poorly. So the TAPSI is low. It's less than 17 millimeters of mercury. We usually take a cutoff of 16 and often see a TAPSI of 13, 12, or even less. That tells you that the right ventricle is failing. So in that case, your systolic pulmonary artery pressure, as well as your mean pulmonary artery pressure is obviously going to be low. However, when you look at echo-derived estimates of the pulmonary artery pressures, it correlates very well with what we get at right heart catheterization. And we know this for a long time, 1984, York and Pop came out with this paper that showed that the catheter-derived RVSP correlates very closely with that measured on echo. And you can see a very nice linear correlation. In fact, the correlation coefficient is 0.93, which is excellent. But echo estimates can also vary widely depending on the method used and the condition causing the pulmonary artery pressure. So this is uh, uh, from Mukherjee and team uh, who looked at pressures in systemic sclerosis. And you can see that it's a good correlation, not great, but good correlation, but you have a lot of outliers on both sides, underestimating and overestimating the uh, pulmonary pressure. And you look at conge uh, congenital heart disease, the accuracy here is about uh, 57%. Yeah, this works out to about 43%. So 50% it's accurate, but in about a third of cases, it underestimates it. And in about a sixth of cases or less, about a tenth of cases, it overestimates the pressures. So it's important that you realize that pressures can be underestimated or overestimated. In the vast majority of cases, they're estimated well. So you really need, why am I showing you this? I think you really need to push your echocardiographer and your cardiology team to do this properly. And I would suggest that the younger ones among you learn to do echocardiography. We're learning to do ultrasound of the chest. This is a small extension of that. And why I'm saying this is if you take trouble and don't look only at the tricuspid regurgitant at velocity, you will get much better figures. So here is something that the British Society of Echocardiography has given us, looking at the tricuspid valve velocity, but also looking at other categories, looking at the ventricles, I'm not gonna go into details, looking at the pulmonary artery, looking at the IVC and the right atrium, you put all these together and you can get an estimate, which is either a low probability of pulmonary hypertension, an intermediate probability of pulmonary hypertension, or a high probability of pulmonary hypertension, by using more than one category. And this is very important for us to do. If you have a high suspicion and your echocardiographer or your cardiologist has said, no, the pulmonary pressure is normal, send them back and say, have you looked at all these categories? What does the ventricle look like? Cross check it with your CT pulmonary angiogram, which will also tell you about the ventricle. It will tell you about the PA diameter. It will tell you about the findings in the pulmonary artery and the IVC. So look at all these also and don't accept just what the echocardiographer has given you. And this is a must know, which is why I've spent some time on it. Another very important measure is the pulmonary vascular resistance. We all know from Ohm's law that the resistance is equal to the potential difference or the voltage measured as V divided by the current. And very similarly, you can get the pulmonary vascular resistance by looking at the potential difference between the mean pulmonary artery pressure and the pulmonary artery wedge pressure or what is happening in the uh, left atrium of the left heart. So the potential difference across these is equivalent to the voltage. You divide it by the cardiac output, which is obviously the flow or the current. Uh, and if you use the figure 80, you get it in nine second. Or you, if you don't use the 80 figure, you get the wood units. So this is measured by the great Paul Wood, 
who's written one of the finest books on cardiology, sadly out of use right now, but he was one of the greats in uh, cardiology. So you can measure it in wood units. The normal pulmonary vascular resistance is two wood units or less. And to make a diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension, you need a pulmonary vascular resistance of more than three wood units. So between two and three wood units, you have a gray zone where you have to use your clinical skills. What are the important causes of pulmonary hypertension? So you look at the registries, they all give you very, very different figures. For instance, a French registry, which came out some time ago, says that group one, this is these four put together, accounts for about 50 to 60% of all pulmonary hypertension, whereas the other causes account for much less. The reveal registry has similar figures and in fact gives us an even higher percentage of group one pulmonary hypertension. But if you look at what causes it across the globe, and that's because that is a very specialized population, about 1% of the global population probably has pulmonary hypertension as compared to what they told us, which is 2.4 per million adults of incidence and prevalence of 15 per million adults. We know now that it's actually 1% of the global population. So it's not a small number. And you take the older population greater than 65, it accounts for about 10% of individuals. Again, a very, very large number worldwide. And worldwide, heart and lung disease, to remind you it's group two and group three are the most frequent causes of pulmonary hypertension. But if you switch from the developed world to the developing world, pulmonary hypertension is frequently associated with congenital heart disease, with infectious disorders, which includes histosomiasis, HIV, and rheumatic heart disease. And while in the developed world, it's more than 65 years, in the developing world, it's those less than 65, which often means that these are people who are in the productive group. These are the economic burdened group who carry the burden of the country, of the family, of society. So it's very sad that we are losing these patients by not picking them up early enough. How often do we make a correct diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension? Just focus on this group, uh, which is looped off. And in the different groups, we make the diagnosis wrongly anywhere from 25% uh, of the time to around 50% of the time. Ignore these two small groups, but between 25 and 50% of the times we make a diagnosis wrongly, these are the correct diagnoses. And this, uh, the authors of this paper concluded by saying, patients diagnosed as having pulmonary hypertension often receive misdiagnoses and are prescribed pH specific medications contrary to guidelines. And this is a very important thing to remember. Don't use PAH specific medications in other conditions. And Dr. Raja is going, uh, sorry, Dr. Partha is going to tell you the exceptions to this. And why is this? This is because most studies are done in pulmonary artery hypertension, which is different from pulmonary hypertension. PAH should be specifically applied only to group one. Only a minority of pulmonary hypertension, as you just saw, is due to PAH. The etiologies are different. The treatments are different. The prognosis is different which is why you need to have completely different approaches. Pulmonary vasoactive medications have been proven to be useful from trials only in pH and not in most other pH, though we are collecting data on some of the other conditions, such as inoperable CTEF. So how do you make an accurate diagnosis of the cause of pH? Don't worry, this is not the slide I'm going to use, but just to tell you this is the overall picture, and it comes from the 2015 guidelines, the European Society of Cardiology, and the European Respiratory Society joint guidelines. And I'm also putting this up because it hasn't changed between 2015 and 2019, the approach. How do you start? You look for the symptoms or signs or a history suggestive of pulmonary hypertension. You do the initial non-invasive assessment, which is, is it compatible with pH? And this includes the chest X-ray ECG, which are poorly sensitive and poorly specific. And you go on to do an echocardiogram if none of these findings are compatible with pH, you search for other causes of these pers this person's symptoms and signs. Uh, if, on the other hand, the non-invasive assessment is compatible, you consider the common causes of pH. And what did I just say? The group two and group three are the common causes. So what do you do? You go back into the history, symptoms and signs, tease out the specifics, look at the ECG and the X-ray again. You look at the echo and if necessary, uh, do a trans, uh, esophageal echo in addition to the transthoracic echo, looking for shunts, both intracardiac and extracardiac. 
look at the lung functions and the HRCT. Again, Dr. Bhattacharya is going to tell you about this. You confirm the diagnosis of group two or three. What do you do next? You look at the diagnosis. If it is confirmed, well and good. If it's not confirmed, you proceed further. If the diagnosis of group two or three is confirmed, you ask yourself, is the pulmonary hypertension proportionate to the severity or is it out of proportion? If it is proportionate to the severity, that means that heart disease or the lung disease is the cause for the pulmonary hypertension. You treat the underlying cause and you keep checking for progression. That's all you do. You do not use pulmonary vasoactive medication. However, if you think it is out of proportion, you think there's a second cause for this pulmonary hypertension, you first do a VQ scan. If the VQ scan, the ventilation perfusion scan, shows you segmental perfusion defects, then you go on to say, oh, I think this is not just group two or three. I think there's a group four component. You consider CTEF, and this is not unusual, or you consider group one prime prime, PVOD, pulmonary veno-occlusive disease, or pulmonary capillary hemangiomatosis, which have as complications uh, involved other systems also. So if there are no segmental perfusion defects, it's not CTEF or group one one, then you consider other common causes, and this will typically be group one. You perform a right heart catheterization, and you look at what is the probability that you're dealing with idiopathic pulmonary artery hypertension. So you do a right heart cath, you get the mean pulmonary artery pressure and the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. If the mean pulmonary artery pressure is greater than 25, and the pulmonary wedge pressure is less than 15, this defines pre-capillary pulmonary hypertension you go on to do more specific diagnostic tests. Now you know you're dealing with group one pulmonary hypertension. If these figures are not met, this is not pre-capillary pulmonary hypertension. It's either post-capillary or combined. You go on to search for other causes. But let's assume you've done the right heart cath. You made sure this is group one. Remember that there are many causes of group one pulmonary hypertension. PVOD, PCH, as I just mentioned, connective tissue disorders, drugs and toxins, HIV, and so on. So you do the appropriate test. For example, you do an HIV test, you do a transthoracic, follow it up with a trans visual echo, you also do a cardiac uh, MR scan, and so on. LFTs, we want to rule out quarter pulmonary hypertension. You, it's none of these. You do the uh, genetic workup, looking for the bone morphogenetic protein uh, receptor, BMPR2 or ALK1 or endoglin, and you go into the detailed family history. And these are all the conditions that you will be looking for. So that's how you approach a person to make a diagnosis. And why is it so important to make a diagnosis? Because survival in pulmonary hypertension depends on the cause. And here you can see that our patients, group three pulmonary hypertension, have the worst prognosis of all as compared to those with heart disease or CTEF or even the dreaded idiopathic pulmonary hypertension or group one. And when you tease it out, you have even more variations within group one itself. Idiopathic pulmonary hypertension does much better, for example, than PVOD, which has the worst prognosis of all in group one. But I'll particularly stress that it is important not to miss CTEF. It's very unfortunate if you miss CTEF, because if you operate on CTEF, look at the survival 10 years from diagnosis, it's almost 80%. If you don't pick it up, either the person cannot be operated on or the person refused surgery, then the five-year survival is just about 40 to 50%. So this is one of those conditions where you can make a huge difference to the person's survival, to the quality of life and to the outcomes if you pick up CTEF. So it's very important not to miss CTEF and I'll come back with a few slides later. Pulmonary artery hypertension, as I mentioned earlier, group one, pre-capillary pulmonary hypertension, few years ago, a decade ago, this was a dreaded disease, as I mentioned, a survival of median survival of 2.8 years. But this has changed and much longer survival has been reported. I myself have a lot of patients who've been going on for quite a few years. What are the therapies that have produced this wonderful change? We have therapies which exploit three pathways. One is the nitric oxide pathway. The second is the prostacyclin pathway. And the third is the endothelin pathway. The uh, nitric oxide pathway basically looks at nitric oxide, which stimulates the conversion of GTP, uh, guanine triphosphate, to cyclic guanine monophosphate. And cyclic guanine monophosphate produces vasodilatation and proliferation. 
We also use PD5 inhibitors, phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors that inhibit the conversion of CGMP to GMP and break it down. So we can delay, inhibit the conversion. Then you get accumulation of CGMP and more vasodilatation and more anti-proliferative effect. We can also directly stimulate uh, soluble guanidinate cyclase, which catalyzes this conversion with this drug called Riosiguat, while the PDE5 inhibitors use sildenafil, tadalafil, and so on. You can also give the person nitric oxide directly in the ICU, and this is sometimes used, which stimulates this conversion. The prostacyclin pathway works on receptors, the IP receptor, which uses another cyclase, adenylate cyclase, which catalyzes the conversion of ATP to cyclic AMP. And cyclic AMP has the same effects as cyclic GMP, using vasodilatation and proliferation. And we have various prostaglandin analogs, uh, epoprostenol, triprostenil, iloprost, and veroprost, most of, most of which have to be given intravenously because they have very short half-lives. You have to give them as a continuous pump. Triprostenil, fortunately, and veroprost have oral formulations, but they are still not available widely. And I don't think triprostenil has still got FDA approval. They're still waiting for evidence. What we do have orally is Selexipag, and we are hoping to get it in India, but the company seems to have lost interest for some reason after Actelion was taken over by Johnson & Johnson, and we are desperately pushing to get Selexipag, a very useful drug. The third pathway is the endothelin pathway, and what basically we have is the endothelin receptors, ETA and ETB, and there are two types of these. These are vasoconstrictive in their action and proliferative in their action. So we block off these ETA receptors or ETB receptors using ambricentan or bucentan and macitentan. Bucentan and macitentan work on both. Ambricentan works on ETA. You have the opposite of vasoconstriction, vasodilatation, and we have an anti-proliferative effect because these are endothelin receptor antagonists. We abbreviate them as ERAs. So these are the three pathways and all the treatments we have work on one or more of these three pathways. So how do you use these drugs? How do you treat pH? You first have to do a risk assessment and this is very important. How do you do this risk assessment? You take various clinical features. You take features from the history using the functional class and the six minute walk distance. A cutoff is 440 meters. Anything more than that is low risk. Less than 165 meters is high risk between 165 and 440 meters is intermediate risk. We also do cardiopulmonary exercise testing, check either BNP or pro-NT-BNP. We go on to do imaging and look at the right atrial area. And we look at the hemodynamics, looking at the right atrial pressure, the cardiac index, and the central, uh, the oxygen consumption. So it's very important that we uh, look at these features and classify people as low risk, intermediate risk, and high risk. This is given in the 2015 guidelines and has been repeated, or rather they refer you to the 2015 guidelines and the 2019 guidelines. So still very useful. And the various other uh, features that are available. So how do you use this? First of all, you have a treatment naive patient who has pulmonary hypertension confirmed by an expert center. Everybody gets general measures and supportive therapy. You can do an acute vasoreactivity test with very tightly defined criteria. This is important because only about 10% show this acute vasoreactivity and only about 1% have persistent response. Such patients do very well with calcium channel blocker therapy, but most are not vasoreactive. And then you classify them as either low or intermediate risk or as high risk. If you have low or intermediate risk, initially you have a chance to give them monotherapy. But if they are intermediate risk or high risk, you give them initial oral combination. If they are high risk, you add on initially, not just the oral combination, you also use a prostacyclin analog. At any point, the patient is not responding. Can I just answer this? Rajshikar, I'm doing a talk in a webinar. I'll call you later. Sorry. Sorry. So you consider for a lung transplant. After three to six months of treatment, and you have to monitor them carefully, you 
decide on their response. And this is where if you have a person who comes to you who's already on treatment, you fit him into the algorithm. So again, you see what has happened after three to six months of treatment. If now you've moved them from either intermediate or high risk to a low risk, you just follow them up very, very frequently, prefer preferably every three to six months. If they have remained in intermediate or high risk, or in future they move from a low risk to an intermediate or high risk, you consider putting them on triple sequential combination and you keep reassessing them. At any point you feel they're getting worse, they can always move into your lung transplant program. Though of course, you refer them for lung transplant right in the beginning, or you list them for lung transplant when they meet the criteria which are laid out by the ISHLT, the International Society of Heart Lung Transplant. So what's been happening? Survival has significantly improved over time. So if you see the National Institutes of Health, when they came out with their data, 91 to 85, look at the survival. And that is what is often quoted, 2.8 year median survival rate. The French registry between 2002 and 2003 has a much better survival. The reveal registry between 2006 and nine has an even better one. And this is an absolutely amazing thing which came out in 2012. The paper came out in 2014, Matsubara and Okayama, which showed that you have almost 100% survival in patients with hereditary pulmonary artery hypertension, still group one. So amazing improvements in, over time, much better really than any of the other features, uh, conditions we're talking about. So please keep your patient's hopes up when you have these. But for this, you really have to individualize treatment, monitor them carefully, and use all three groups of pulmonary vasoactive drugs appropriately. So there is light at the end of the tunnel. They're always ill, as we're seeing this in various different areas. And then comes COVID-19 to put us down again. And I'm just going to stop with two or three slides. What happens in uh, COVID-19 is you get microvascular changes. Lovely paper by Ackerman and company. Uh, just six autopsies, but beautifully done. They showed that there was lymphocytic inflammation of the pulmonary arterioles and capillaries. You have a lot of, and you can see this infiltration. You have microthrombi within the pulmonary capillaries. You have fibrin, which is extruded in this rich exudate into the alveoli with RBCs. Obviously, the person is breathless. If you compare the architecture of a normal lung capillaries with the distorted architecture in COVID-19. And you can see what they call, apart from the microthrombosis described earlier, into susceptive angiogenesis, where the blood vessel grows within, producing a kind of shelf within the capillaries. That's the simplest way I can explain it. And the more normal sprouting angiogenesis, where you have new sprouts of tiny vessels, which therefore is also not very good for uh, blood flow. And you have, you can actually see within the pulmonary capillary walls, the vi uh, virus particles, which are therefore responsible obviously for what is happening. And what happens, you see hypo hypoxia, which leads to hypoxic vasoconstriction. The first step in group three pulmonary hypertension as a part of the cytokine storm. You have mitochondrial dysfunction, which therefore leads to endothelial dysfunction and causes vasoconstriction. You have oxidative stress and damage the DNA, preventing it from repairing itself. And you have NC2 thrombosis, both in the small and the large vessels, which is quite a big problem. And we've had several cases of pulmonary thrombosis, uh, pulmonary embolism, both in C2 and embolic disease in patients who've had uh, COVID-19, which is why we believe that every single person who has COVID-19, mild, moderate, or severe, should receive at least an antiplatelet agent with statins or anticoagulation. And there's a whole host of reasons how the heart also get effect, gets affected. And uh, this excellent paper, appropriately called POTUS, uh, as in President of the United States, uh, similarities between COVID-19 and pulmonary hypertension, and they draw attention to a whole host of changes. We don't know which way this proceeds. So what we believe, this is our uh, protocol, anticoagulation for everybody, or at least aspirin or clopidogrel along with a statin. And as a person goes into severe disease, you may choose to move from prophylactic anticoagulation to therapeutic anticoagulation. And what we use is we use the ISTH SIC score, the International Society for Thrombosis and uh, Hematology, uh, their severity score. We 
also use the has bled score to assess the risk for bleeding and then decide whether the person should get prophylactic or therapeutic anticoagulation. A few slides, about 10 slides, but a much shorter time on CTEF. CTEF is defined by the following observations made after at least three months of effective anticoagulation. So that three months tells you this is a chronic condition. The pulmonary artery pressure, the mean pulmonary artery pressure should be 25. They haven't yet changed it, but many people are talking it should be made 20, like the other types of pulmonary hypertension, with a pulmonary capillary wedge pressure of less than 15, because the emboli lodge in the pulmonary arterioles and arteries. So this is clearly pre-capillary. So there is pulmonary hypertension, which is that part of the CTEF. And it is due to thromboembolic disease, so hence it is chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. These are the differences between the chronic emboli, and you can see they're completely organized, they're fibrotic, they look white or yellowish with the fat over them, compared to acute emboli, which look very, very different. Why do you get CTEF? Because there's mechanical obstruction of the pulmonary vascular bed, but you also get a small vessel vasculopathy in the unobstructed vascular bed, probably because all the blood is being diverted through the unobstructed areas. So you get changes in the small vessels also. And that's what we are seeing here. Large vessels, you get obstruction. Smaller vessels also you can get obstruction, but even in unobstructed area, you can get obstruction. And these are called A, B and C type vessels. So you do a VQ scan, as I mentioned earlier, which is one of the earliest things you do. You get mismatched defects then you know that you're dealing with pulmonary artery obstructions, putting it straight away into group four. And if you can prove that these are thromboembolic, then you have CTEF. Pulmonary angiography is the gold standard, and it's very different when you see the pulmonary thromboembolic disease from other kinds. And here you can see a web or a flap, you see a cutoff of that vessel, and you can see cutoff of some of the smaller vessels. So CTEF looks very different when you do a pulmonary angiography. Uh, so it's a very, very useful thing. Uh, but what we use typically is we use the 64 or 128 or now 256 multi-detector CT. A 64 multi-slice CT is good enough. What we do is we look for direct effect, indirect effects, and effects uh, evidence of pH. So you can see a large pulmonary artery bigger than the aorta. This tells you this pulmonary hypertension. You may see the clot applied to the side of the vessel, which tells you it's chronic. Or you can see these webs or flaps or bands, as they're called, running across a smaller vessel, so the lobar and segmental vessels. And all these are typical features of chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. You can see it in deeper vessels also, but you can also see acute things there. These are the differences between acute and chronic disease. And sometimes, I'm sorry, I meant to show you this. You can see evidence of chronic disease, lateral applied to the wall, and also lying free in the center of the vessel. This is acute and this is chronic. So we've realized these days that a lot of patients who present you with acute pulmonary embolism, you have to look carefully for CTEF because otherwise you'll miss it. And one of the clues is acute pulmonary embolism does not develop pulmonary hypertension, certainly not very acutely. It takes time to develop pulmonary hypertension because the right ventricle cannot generate this pressure acutely. It's got to adapt over time. So very soon the patient will go into failure, right ventricular failure, rather than produce this high pressure. So if you see pulmonary hypertension in somebody with an acute pulmonary embolism, ask yourself, there is chronic pulmonary thromboembolic disease already there. And these are the features of acute P, large clots lying in the center, smaller clots lying in the center, as opposed to the chronic form that is there. But one of the very useful clues is to look for bronchopulmonary collaterals. And you can see these bronchopulmonary collaterals running between the bronchial arteries or the aorta into the pulmonary vessels. And you can see this leash of vessels, which are at the side. And you can see even better this beautiful leash of vessels running between the two arterial systems. And this Professor Cherian, my senior colleague in cardiology showed, I think in 1984, well before the West showed it, that you have a lot of these collaterals in embolic pulmonary hypertension, as he called it then, as compared to primary pulmonary hypertension, which has no collaterals, which we now call idiopathic pulmonary artery hypertension. What is the treatment for CTEF? Pulmonary endarterectomy. It's not a thrombectomy. It's not an embolectomy. You actually have to take out the endothelial layer and take out the whole 
organized clot along with the endothelium, which is why it's called an endarterectomy. Those are the kind of specimens you get when it's in the large vessels. And you can go down to the segmental, lobar segmental, subsegmental vessels. And this is what you don't want, something called trousers, not tails. And this is the kind of thing we try and rule out when we're trying to select patients for uh, CTEF uh, treatment, that is pulmonary endarterectomy. And I'll stop with the last few slides. You get a huge improvement in functional class. This is the Papworth experience. Before the pulmonary endarterectomy was done, most patients were in group three and group four. Three months later, only a minority are in class four and a few are in class three, less than 25%. Most have moved into class one and two. And 12 months down the line, it's even better. And most patients have even left class two and moved into class one. So amazingly good results. Practically all your patients are in class one and two, and you never get this kind of improvement in quality of life and functional status with any other kind of uh, pulmonary hypertension, which is why it's so important for you to try and pick up CTEF. So I'll stop with a few key messages and thank you all for your very, very patient hearing and Dr. Partha for inviting me. Pulmonary hypertension is more common than realized and makes a huge difference to the outcome. The diagnosis depends on a high clinical suspicion and it's got to be confirmed by echocardiography. It can be proven by right heart catheterization, which is the gold standard. The diagnosis of the exact cause is important as survival depends on diagnosis. Pulmonary endarterectomy for CTEF has excellent outcomes, so please look for it. But survival of pulmonary artery hypertension also has improved with the new therapies. We may not give them the same quality of life as with pulmonary endarterectomy, but you keep them living longer and definitely an improvement in functional class. However, and this is important to remember, use of pulmonary artery hypertension therapies for the other groups may lead to worse outcomes and therefore your choice must be carefully made and carefully monitored. And finally, COVID-19 may increase the burden of pulmonary hypertension that we are going to face hugely in the next coming few years. So please learn how to treat pulmonary hypertension properly. Thank you very much for your patient hearing. Thanks, Murli. Absolutely brilliant talk. Really, really enjoyed that. Thank you very much. Um, I'll use the moderator's prerogative and ask you a couple of questions and then maybe we'll move to Dr. Bhattacharya's talk and then we'll um, have a discussion again. Um, so I was very intrigued with your comment about pulmonologists learning how to do proper echocardiography in trying to diagnose pulmonary hypertension. <clears throat> of pulmonologists learning how to do right heart catheterization and there's people in the audience today who are young buddhist budding pulmonologists or sort of pulmonologists who are young who would want to set up a pulmonary hypertension clinic i wanted to ask you i mean know that there's a place for echocardiography we know there's a place for right heart catheter for someone who wants to set up a pulmonary hypertension clinic what percentage of patients that you see across the five classes would actually end up needing a right heart catheter. And between the two, if you have to choose one skill between learning proper echocardiography for right heart versus cardiac cath, where would you place both? So <laughs> I'm a greedy person, Raja. I believe we should learn both. And we know pulmonologists in the West, especially in the UK, are doing their right heart cats themselves. Andrew Peacock in, um, in Glasgow, uh, he runs the Scottish Pulmonary Vascular Research Institute. He does his own right heart cats. Paul Corris in Newcastle does his own. Irene Lang in Vienna does her own. So pulmonologists, uh, people who are interested in pulmonary hypertension are straddling the area between cardiology and pulmonology. And they are refusing to call themselves either cardiologists or pulmonologists any longer. So I think we should be doing both. And I think, you know, if you're going to focus on one area, um, as you say, then I would probably choose... Um, I, I think I'm going to choose pulmonary uh, right heart cats for the simple reason that if you can train a good echocardiographer, he can do a good echo for you or she can do a good echo. For you. We have some excellent echo technicians who can do as good or a better job than most cardiologists I know. So that is trainable. Uh, Non-doctor is not going to be authorized to do a right heart cat. So I think purely from the fact that, you know, it's a uh, legal issue. It's a regulatory issue. I think if you had to choose one, you'd choose a right heart cath. And I think cardiologists would be most happy to hand that over to you because it's, 
it's not something that gives them money. It's a purely diagnostic procedure. They'd be most happy to hand it over to us and train us in doing this. I wish I was 20 years younger. I, I would start doing them myself. And so what percentage of your patients across the five uh, classes would end up getting a right heart cath, uh, Muli? So all, all patients with CTEF get them these days because we anyway have to do a coronary angiogram. I didn't go into that, but essential is you don't want to do a pulmonary endarterectomy and have them come back to you with a you know, coronary artery disease needing uh, CABG one year down the line. So we always do a, uh, CA, uh, a CAG, a coronary angiogram. Uh, and at the same time, we do a uh, right heart cath. Uh, all group one should have it for the simple reason that, so I'd say, you know, your, your left heart uh, anyway has it, any uh, your disease. So group one, two, and uh, four will be having it anyway. So that accounts for at least 50% of your pulmonary hypertensions. The group three, that's our group uh, related to hypoxia, OSA, and you know, lung disease don't usually have it. And it's usually pretty obvious unless there is this out of proportion pulmonary hypertension, which I think Dr. Bhattacharya is going to tell us about. And group five, it's a very, very vague category. It's a small number. I don't think that's a big number. So a large group will actually need a right heart cath. Right. Okay. Grand. I've got just one small question before I sort of uh, invite Parthada in. Um, I was intrigued by your mention of a statin along with an antiplatelet and anticoagulants. That's not something that I've seen much in the literature. So your thoughts about using a statin for COVID-19 infection, Samundi? So I'm saying that for two reasons. One is the science behind it. And unfortunately, we don't yet have the evidence. So sometimes in COVID, we've had to move so fast. I believe it's justified to extrapolate science into your practice uh, without waiting for the evidence. So I would love to have the evidence. There are a couple of papers I've seen where they've looked uh, at data retrospectively of patients who were on statins and patients who were not on statins and indicated that there were better outcomes when they were already on statins for other reasons. The other reason is the science, which is uh, statins have a endothelial uh, protective property. They are very useful. They have pleiotrop pleiotropic mechanisms of action uh, and they correct endothelial dysfunction. And we know that endothelial dysfunction, the endothelialitis, as that paper by Ackerman and others shows, underlies a lot of the problems. So when you have mild disease, I believe it's justified to use uh, an antiplatelet agent along with the statin. Uh, they also have other anti-inflammatory effects. I mean, this, the, the benefits that you get at statins are huge. And I'm a big believer in statins. I'm on statins myself, so I can tell you I'm a proud uh, upholder of the statin thing. But I'll agree with you, Raja. It's not based on very strong evidence. It's more my feeling. And when you do a risk-benefit analysis, I believe people should get statins along with an antiplatelet agent, at least in mild disease. Grant, thank you. Thank you, Murli. Parthada, any questions for Murli before we move to your talk? Thank you. Okay. So, uh, gives me great pleasure. Um, I'm actually honored. I don't know whether... Uh, is Rito Bruto there? Is he, has he joined us now? I'm not sure. I'm not seeing him. Okay. Okay. No so, you just begin it's then. Great pleasure to invite Parthada, uh, Parthada <coughs> uh, the, uh, the father of uh, the Institute of Palmo Care and Research, Kolkata, which we have all um, admired over the years. Um, Dr. Parthada is not only an academic pulmonologist, he is also an innovative pulmonologist, got a number of innovations on treating various pulmonary problems, uh, multiple publications, and I don't think I need to uh, spend more time introducing Parthada to this audience. So he's going to talk about treatment of uh, pulmonary hypertension uh, from COPD. I know this is something close to his heart. Um, so Parthada, the stage is all yours. Uh, over to you. Thank you, Raja. Thank you, Dr. Murli Mohan, for such wonderful deliberations. I cannot imagine a better... Um, overall wrap up of pulmonary hypertension than this, what you have said. It is all distilled out from your great experience. Now, Dr. Murli Mohan and me are both Lord Krishna by name. He is Murli Mohan, I am Partha Sharathi. Dr. Murli Mohan plays his flute in the in the, uh, in Vrindavan and I am Partha Sharathi, I am at the battlefield. I, am, I work at the grassroots level. Let me, let me upload my talk here. 
So my job is uh, a little different and my challenges are also different. So when I decided that I will take up this talk, uh, Raja knows it well, this is very close to my heart because in many occasions we have interacted together in different conferences as well. Um, I thought uh, initially I prepared a talk uh, based on evidence. Uh, then I thought, well, why not I just uh, disclose my experience, my journey. I'm a very small person to say my experience, but there is a journey in my last 10, 12 years course of understanding pulmonary hypertension. So I decided I will just make a story out of it and discuss with uh, the August audience today. I have no conflict of interest. I look for my credibility. Really, do I, uh, uh, do I claim that I am credible to give such a talk? Well, I found that uh, from my PowerPoint basket, uh, there are 10 times or eight times I had given talk on pH and COPD. So I felt okay. I started it way back in 2010 and now it is 2020. And last was in 2019. In between, I, <clears throat> I recorded one talk to my ethics committee also. Actually, my journey started uh, in 2009 and Palmocon was a very you know, triggering event in that. In that Palmocon, we invited uh, Dr. Maurya Sukhar. And uh, this uh, German gentleman came and we were very happy to interact with him. By then, the guideline for the diagnosis of treatment of pulmonary hypertension was just published. It was a joint task force uh, uh, expression of uh, diagnosis of treatment of pulmonary hypertension by European Society of Cardiology, European Respiratory Societies, and other societies. This was one of the tables. I went through it. Echocardiography is recommended as a screening test. Agreed. Class 1 evidence. Right heart catheterization is recommended for a definite diagnosis of pH due to lung disease. I was stumbling. I don't have any access to right heart catheterization. And most of my patients won't accept the proposal, neither would they afford it. Then I came down. The optimal treatment for underlying lung disease, including long-term oxygen therapy in patients with chronic hypoxemia, is recommended in patients with pH due to lung disease. Well, that everyone knows. Patients with out of proportion of pH due to lung disease should be enrolled in RCTs. They should be treated, accepted. And the fifth one is the use of pH specific drug therapy is not recommended in patients with pH due to lung diseases. So it says, no, don't treat these patients. There is no evidence, but you see patients day in and day out. You treat your best, you do your best possible rehabilitation to these patients. You give home oxygen, and you try to ex exclude other causes that can cause shortness of breath. And once you are stuck up, you look at your echocardiography. Yeah, there is pH. And then you decide, should I treat or should I not? So because I am in the war field, I am Parthosarathy, I thought, okay, let me see if I can do, make out anything, if I can, if I can treat these patients. I, I had a talk just after that conference on radiological diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension. These are very obvious. See the right main pulmonary artery is so wide. If it is more than 18 millimeter in diameter, it is a very specific sign for presence of pulmonary hypertension. Similarly, the obliteration of the retrosternal space in lateral view is also important. Kenameto et al. has um, done several measurements, some ratios, and they have shown that the Control versus primary pulmonary hypertension or pH can be easily uh, differentiated by these measurements. So I thought I have chest X-ray, the cheapest available investigation that can give me a clue for, clue for diagnosis. Firstly, I have to diagnose the patient. And secondly, and secondly, I have to decide whether I can treat them or not. Well, let me come to the CT scan. I will not be dealing much with it. If you see the pulmonary root diameter more than aortic root diameter or the pulmonary root diameter more than 2.9 millimeter. And if you see the pulmonary artery branches are more than the accompanying, accompanying bronchial diameters. So in multiple loads, this is very, very sensitive and specific sign for pulmonary hypertension. In fact, the specificity is up to 100%. The sensitivity is low. So I decided I will diagnose pulmonary hypertension without doing right heart catheterization. And I made out in my mind that it should be a clinical radio echocardiographic diagnosis. In the clinical suspicion of pH, I'm not going into details of it. 
in the radiological investigation, I will take chest X-ray, HRCT chest. I'll also put ECG, although it has got a, uh, not much of sensitivity and specificity to diagnose, but still there are certain signs of right ventricular strain, right ventricular hypertrophy, secondary to pulmonary hypertension that might help, and echocardiography Doppler should be a must. If all the features are present, it's that the patient has got pulmonary hypertension. Meanwhile, once I was looking, I looked at a paper published by this gentleman. He's uh, uh, Anton von Nurgraf. I don't know whether I pronounced the name rightly, but uh, this paper, the conclusion wrote that CEPT, cardiopulmonary exercise characteristics show large overlap in both groups. I'm not interested in that because I don't have access to cardiopulmonary exercise tests as well. But the last sentence is very important. However, SPO2 at rest and further decrease, low SPO2 at rest and further decrease during exercise similarly suggests the presence of pH in COPD. So I felt if my patient shows desaturation on exercise, then the likelihood of pH would be very high and this can be a screening test for me. That took me to use my pulse oximeter and let the patient walk in my chamber for a minute or so and then re-measure the uh, saturation. It was in 2000, end 2009. I was very lucky this patient gentleman came to me. He was a 66 year old diabetic hypertensive smoker and he was symptomatic for eight years with progressive shortness of breath. I investigated him. Uh, he was a case of rank COPD. And, uh, and when uh, I saw him at the end of uh, 2009, he was quite uh, ill and his CAT score was very high. 22, and this was his data I, and I just gathered together. By 2009, his FEV1 is 0.73, and it went up to, uh, it was 0 0.70 in 2010. It was the post-dilator, uh, post-bronchodilator FEV1 is barely 23%. His saturation at rest was 92%. I can see it has dropped from 97%, 95% from 2007 to 2009 and 2010. Saturation after exercise, what I started doing by then, I saw it was 94% in 2009, and I could do a six minutes walk test. It was 1,340 feet. Take it for the feet, and by when, once it deteriorated in 2010, it, the saturation came down to 96, 86 from 92%. Bit of gap, big gap of six, and the six minutes walk distance also been reduced quite a lot. So I asked for echocardiography. The estimated PS systolic pressure was 45 millimeter of mercury. And this is the formula what Dr. Murlingon has shown. We could calculate the mean pulmonary artery pressure. With due permission and um, uh, consent, I started him on sildenafil. Slowly, I raised the dose. And on next visit, I have no date here. But here you can see that, sorry, this has increased to 1,200 something, yeah, 1,230 feet. And, uh, CAT score came down from 22 to 14. There was a good subjective improvement. The gentleman was very happy. So it gave me some bit of confidence that they are treatable. It's not that the guideline has said, don't treat them. Uh, it doesn't mean that they are not treatable. Meanwhile, a second patient came to me, a smoker of 50, over 20 years, 55 year old. He had progressive shortness of breath for four years. And once he came to me, he was uh, MRC4. He had emphysema on clinical radiologically. FEV1 was 58%, moderate uh, reduction in FEV1, but TLC was very low, 30%. And SPO2 at rest was 86%. I asked him for echocardiography. It was 78 millimeter of mercury systolic pressure. So it's a moderate reduction in FEV1 with a marked rise in pulmonary artery pressure. Uh, he, he was uh, not having any feature of OSA, I did a screening test, it was negative. I did a CTPA, there was no sick uh, chronic pulmonary thrombembolism. So it was a disproportionate pulmonary hypertension in a patient of COPD. By now I know that there are two phenotypes of pH in COPD. One group is pH COPD, where COPD is just an association with pulmonary hypertension. It may be just like pulmonary artery hypertension with COPD. And this is a small number, small frequency, one to 5%. The majority is uh, 95 to 98% severe COPD with mild to moderate pH. And this pH is secondary to COPD. 
And this pH is the main problem for me because a lot of my patients have got pH with severe pulmonary hypertension. So these are my lessons. Uh, I <clears throat> This red mark shows my limitations also. I looked again in the literature. Meanwhile, I found by American literature, ACCF AHA 2009 expert consensus document pul for pulmonary hypertension, it allowed a physician to decide pulmonary treat, to treat pulmonary hypertension with chronic lung disease, but uh, provided the chronic lung disease and hypoxemia are optimally treated and transpulmonary gradient, that is, the <clears throat> that is a difference between the mean pulmonary artery pressure and pulmonary capillary or pulmonary artery wedge pressure difference and pulmonary vascular resistance are significantly elevated. The patient symptoms suggest that pH-specific therapy may yield clinical benefit. I don't have right heart catheterization. I'm again stuck, but it gives some, me some support. I remember in one conference, Raja and I had some discussion about this. Well, I went back to that old paper uh, with Anton, and he wrote, however, a low SpO2 at rest and further decrease during exercise, it similarly suggests the presence of pH in COPD. So I looked at the, I, meanwhile, I started recording my patients of P, all my patients for evidence of COPD in my own protocol of clinical radio cardiographic criteria. And once I came to around 300 patients, this was the you know, distribution where 38 to 40% patients were COPD, 15% were possibly echo. So together it is 50, 50, 55% to, to total. This was a survival statistics. COPD with pH and COPD without pH. You can see the difference. So the patients will die. And in front of you, some patient is standing who has got pH with a COPD. You are trying your best to treat him. You don't find any other reason to explain his pH. And you still hold your hand tight. Sorry, I can't try it because the guideline has barred me. So I, I, I had problem to accept that. So then I thought, how can I treat these patients? I just uh, rebrushed the, my, my criteria a little better. My judgment decision was this. I made it a little more uh, uh, objective. And I added one more point. When the patient had documentation of hypoxia on defined exercise. This took me a defined exercise. What is a defined exercise? Six minutes walk test is a defined exercise. But I don't have access, direct access to six minutes walk test, although I can do it. Well, in that, I decided I have to find out an exercise of my own. So I made marking in my own consultation office, 15 years up and down walking and seeing the saturation between two poles walking and seeing the saturation, many such things. And ultimately I came to something which I'll touch upon later on. Meanwhile, this WHO thing is very important. The, functional status of COPD patients, which Dr. Mullimon has already uh, elaborated. I made my own algorithm for treating patients of COPD pH. You have to diagnose COPD. You have to exclude other causes of pH as far as feasible. You have to treat COPD optimally, including long-term oxygen therapy and the best possible rehabilitation. That is the most important thing. And then assess your patients for pH. pH is present and you also assess the functional status. If the patients have got a relatively preserved, good functional status, uh, assess the underlying disease, try to optimize treatment, see for some time. If there is improvement, continue that. Don't treat for pH. But if the patients have got poor functional status and, and there is no improvement with treatment for a duration, say a few weeks, then you can think of starting treatment. This is my this is my protocol of starting anti-pH treatment. And I felt that I should continue on it. I was very cautious. I put it forward to my ethics committee. I got it passed and I made a protocol on that protocol. Uh, stringently, um, I followed it and I just started treating COPD patients. But my deficit was that I had no right heart catheterization. They had no hemodynamic data. So I, I was really feeling bad that what I'm doing, I'm not sure. And I'm sure that they won't be published anywhere. Meanwhile, so sometimes crazy people start something and you, I started a small journal. We had a palmo face, a small a sort of booklet. I converted to a journal and I felt that I can publish in my own journal. 
<laughs> and this uh, this was one such publication, the etiological profile and the response to treatment to sildenafil in class three pulmonary hypertension. Of 309 patients, I had COPD 107, which is 34.63%. And this is asthma, actually, these are echo. Mm. Well, of course, few patients, unlikely asthma, I have one publication on that also, but I'm not going into it. But ultimately, 35 plus another 15%. It's going to about 50%. The effect of treatment was seen on 44 patients uh, over three months where I found the CAT score. The only endpoint which I looked at, it was uh, reduced from 14.48. It was significant. And the patients were better. I was happy that my patients are doing well. The patients uh, used to come and say, I am better. That gives you a positive feedback. I recorded I had seven um, uh, adverse events and uh, two patients were hospitalized, but they were because of acute exacerbations, not because of any medication side effect. So this was my second publication in the same journal <clears throat> where I followed them for a long time. And here the total number was 39, whom I followed for one year and see the, and I didn't change the dose. And they, uh, peculiarly, they went on improving over time and uh, difference was highly significant. It was um, significant from between first and the second visit, but for the first and the last visit, the significance was very significant, very much. By then in 2013, when I was publishing in my own journal in 2014, one publication came out by the same old Lanton von Nurgra. He wrote Sildenafil, a definite no to COPD. I was a little taken aback, but I didn't lose hope. I was going through other articles. <clears throat> During that time only in European Respiratory Journal, this article was published. You can see the increase in cardiac output compared to rest with maximum exercise. The pH people cannot raise their cardiac output as the non-pH COPD patients can do. And the left-hand side, if you can see, the pH is more frequent in advanced COPD, not in early COPD. So, this gave me some insight into it. And this chart is very important. Uh, on the right hand side, if you can see that uh, if you make a patient exercise, the patients with pH, they cannot raise their pulmonary artery pressure. That way, the way the non pH patients can do. And in the process, they show decline in their PAO2. And the PO2 decline, if it is four for the non pH patients, it will be 12 for the pH patients. So if a patient's of COPD pH exercises, these are all COPD patients, they will have a more decline of saturation, more decline of PaO2, and they will desaturate more. So I was sure that my exercise test is going to give me some clue like that. Well, I was thinking to refine my exercise test. And finally, I came down to a test called two chair test. I felt this is the best way. Patient need not go outside my chamber. 15 years is quite a distance. Some people may not have a 15 years uh, free walking space in that office, but moving between two chairs is very easy and everybody can do it. So I went to two chair test. Here, let me come to the basic physiology a little. I consider my system as a cycle. There is a respiratory result, there is a circulatory result. And both the results, God has given us both these results, perhaps in a on a fantastic you know, ratio. And if you see, VQ ratio is normally one. So if there is one circulatory result, there is one respiratory result. If the circulatory result is four, respiratory result is four. They are same, one to one. So I can, if I can, can make a box and the upper part of the box is a respiratory result, the lower part of the box is circulatory result, this is 50-50. What happens in COPD? There is reduction in respiratory result but there is an automatic adjustment. Body is such a wonderful machine that automatically adjusts and the circulatory reserve also goes down. If there is a bronchoconstriction at any point of time, there is vasoconstriction in that area also. So actually body wants to maintain a ratio of one, a similar ratio between ventilation and perfusion. So this is an early stage where 60% of the capacity, if the joint capacity is 100, out of that, this bit is 60%. 60% of the total reserve is maintained. The patients have got mild symptoms. They're functionally, they're class one or class two. But if it is late, if the, if the ventilated reserve has gone quite low, 
and simultaneously the circulatory reserve is also down. It happens. It happens not just because uh, of um, concomitant physiological response. It, be, it happens because of many reasons. The COPD causes on the circulatory system in the pulmonary vascular bed that the pulmonary vascular reserve also goes down. There are six, seven, or eight mechanisms. I'm not enumerating, enumerating them. But once it becomes 30% of the total, the patients may be symptomatic. And once they are symptomatic, once they are symptomatic, we need to see where the reserve is lost. Is it the respiratory reserve or is it the circulatory reserve? I try to be as simple as possible. And I had no other way. For a grassroots physician, what can I do? I thought, well, I have DLCO in my hand. I've got spirometry in my hand. I can assess a bit of respiratory, ventilatory reserve and diffusion. Regarding circulatory reserve, I have got echocardiography. I went to my senior, who is a fantastic echocardiographist. He agreed to me. He gave special attention. By now, I get kind of echocardiography results, which match just like, just as good as, uh, or I mean, near to uh, right heart catheterization data the, and right heart catheterization. And third, I felt circulatory response to exercise. If the circulatory reserve is reduced, the circulatory response to exercise will also be jeopardized. And how to assess the circulatory response? This led me to look for a post-exercise desaturation status. Once the patient is, once the patient has done exercise, and and um, and after that he stops, then the whole other system that goes into rest, but the heart is functioning. So if I measured saturation after exercise, perhaps it will reflect better where the circulatory response uh, to exercise. The same picture that I have shown earlier. So this is my two chair test. Two chairs are kept front to face to face with a five feet difference between front to front. And a patient is asked to sit on, on one chair, then move to the other chair and sit, and then come back to the previous chair. <clears throat> this is called one movement. And I asked the patient to make five movements. I tried with four movements. I tried with six movements. I tried with five movements. I tried and after five movements, what? Uh, you measure the pulse rate and saturation every 10 seconds. Well, these are the two, two GR test reports of two patients of COPD. Here you can see the resting pulse rate is 95. It goes up to shoots up to 106. Then gradually goes down, down, down to 95 again by 120 seconds. This has been done after many trial and errors. And saturation from 95 goes down to 92 immediately after exercise, then to 91, 91, 92, 93, 94, again to 95, again to 94. This is other patient. Here I cannot see the right hand side. Here also you can see the pulse rate from 84 shoots up to 115 and then gradually comes down to 84 and saturation falls and then becomes again to normal. So there is a desaturation. The maximum desaturation from the baseline is called desaturation maximum. We named it DSAT max or desaturation maximum. Here from 96, it has come down to 91. So there is a desaturation of five. <clears throat> well, with this, uh, we started treating and this two chair test is only recently published. Uh, I have a desire to give a talk on two chair test in um, uh, near future. If so, if I can make it, I'll let you all know. And uh, you will find this is very interesting. And in COVID era, I feel it's very, very important because two chair tests can diagnose early COVID, can diagnose progression of COVID, can diagnose post-COVID symptoms, post-COVID lung involvement, and can diagnose also the progress of post-COVID lung fibrosis. This is my view. Well, coming back to my understanding, then looking at the circulatory and respiratory reserve, we have got echocardiography and two chair tests. We have got spirometry and DLCO. If they're mildly reduced, this I'm not given any value, then there is no treatment required. We just follow up. Once you do echocardiography, you can also look at the left ventricular dysfunction. My echocardiography does a lot for me. He looks for left ventricular dysfunction, both systolic diastolic. He looks for left ventricular feeding pressure, right ventricular volume. He looks for <clears throat> uh, he looks for tricuspid regurgitation and many other parameters so that I have a fairly good precise diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension and the left ventricular function also. If it is moderately reduced and it is sure, but if it is less than 2% desaturation, one need to be observed very thoroughly 
and treatment may be given or may not be given. I have not given treatment to these patients. But if the desaturation or desat max is more than 3%, I treated them for pH and monitor. Well, you can ask me why that 3%. That will take another lecture. I'm not going into details of it. Is a treatment of COPDPH needed? I was thinking once again, because by then it was 2016 or 2015 or 16. Then I was looking at the literature. I got a literature 2017. This is Gizan Pulmonary Hypertension Registry. You have already seen that Spanish registry, the same thing. Here, here there are several categories of pulmonary hypertension patients. All right heart catheter has been done. The lung disease pH and pH, we used to feel that pH is the worst category. See the pH and lung disease pH. And this is transplant free survival between etiological groups. In one year, three year and five years, lung disease pH is far worse than pH. We have grown up with the idea that pH is dangerous. Idiopathic pulmonary hypertension is sinister. It would kill your patient within a few years, but here it's just the reverse. So it made me feel that, well, I must try more hard to treat my COPD patients with pH. Then I looked again at the literatures and coming to the summary. And this is a summary published in 2012 or 2013. You can see the evidence so poor. The number of patients included in several studies, 5, 18, 15, 20, 20, 20. Well, the endpoints are all different. The treatment is different. The dose of 50 milligram BID. If I feel that if a patient of COPD pH is given 50 milligram of sildenafil, he will have a lot of problems. He'll have gross VQ mismatch has been precipitated and the patient might go down. So ultimately, uh, I'm not going into de details of the results of this study. Ultimately, it was, uh, uh, the, I think, what Anton Vaughan has said, no to sildenafil is the perfect answer. Given freedom to everybody to treat it with a drug might cause a lot of things. We need to streamline. I don't say that you follow me. But whatever I have done, I have tried to be ethical. I have taken my ethics permission. I've got all data with me and I have tried to publish whatever I could. So this is my revised strategy for treatment in 2016. Here, treating COPD, treating comorbidities, treating hypoxemia, trying rehabilitation, then testing two cities is the most important. And I used to start at treating patients with this at max more than 3%. Try sildenafil built from low dose, 10 milligram TDS. Look for change in 2CT and CAT score. And here I have given less importance to the functional status of these patients. This is a, a concert sort of thing where I could include 89 patients in two chair tests. This at max was more than 3% in 62. And finally, when I treated the patients, those had this at max of more than 3%. After three months, the CAT score has fallen from 12 to 7. So it is highly, highly significant. And the minimum change in saturation was also significant. So these patients improve, and I could publish this. Uh, the same thing being shown in an international journal. Well, but the objective evidence is not there. I have no hemodynamic data. So I tried very hard to find hemodynamic, to make hemodynamic data. This is a basic already Dr. Mulidharan has discussed. Uh, what I want to say that the difference between the mean pressure here and the pulmonary artery wedge pressure here, this is the transpulmonary gradient. And if this is divided by cardiac output, you get the pulmonary vascular resistance. And this pulmonary vascular resistance is contributed by the pre-capillary segment. So this is most important. And here the vasodilators act, not here. If you have you see WB being raised, then there is something problem out here, the left ventricle, left atria, the left side of the heart, the hypertension. But if it is pre-capillary, then it's in the pulmonary circulation. Here, possibly your drugs will work. So this is my second publication, hemodynamic endorsement of the post-exercise desaturation-based decision of treating COPD pH. A pilot observation, a small number, 11 plus 718. Yes, you can see the PVR, pulmonary vascular resistance in the treated group is 3.64. Food CMT is 1.68. So you can find that PCWP is high in both the groups. That is perplexing to me. All the patients have got high PCWP. I do not do pulmonary uh, catheterization myself, but I have to explain this. And, and if it is true, then my COPD pH patients are predominantly mixed COPD pH. 
they're both class two and class three or group two and group three COPD pH. Well, this has taken me uh, to a further challenge. I have already done uh, um, right heart catheterization in more than 55 COPD pH patients. The findings are almost similar to what I've um, already disclosed in my pilot observations. The admixture of class two pH is obvious in my patients. I have looked at literature that uh, nearly, um, I mean, nearly universal presence is uh, not recorded. There is variable degree of presence, maybe from 20 to 40, 50%. And, um, and we have to explore it and now in details. So this is what I wanted to mean my journey for last 10 years in understanding and treating, treating COPD pH, staying at the grassroots level. And now, now I can see there's a long area to swim. And uh, I believe that uh, this, um, this, this uh, job should be taken up by my juniors and the next generation of uh, pulmonologists. Uh, a lot of them, will, I'm sure, will be interested in pulmonary hypertension. This is a very, very fascinating chapter. I don't have the experience, the kind of experience Dr. Murli Mohan has, has, uh, has got, but I still feel it's very fascinating. And I always consider pulmonary hypertension is not just a chapter. It's like a book. It's a big book. It's a subject. It's a, so it's a neglected part of pulmonology. And we should give now much more attention to it. With this, I hope that tomorrow will be better for us. And uh, I do not know how far my approach of treating COPD pH will be endorsed by my colleagues uh, in my country and abroad. But I have tried my way and uh, I'm trying to refine it further. Uh, I would love to come to you with my two chair test. I love to come to you with my experience of, um, of a possible explanation of uh, raised um, pulmonary artery wedge pressure in COPD patients and, um, and the effect of uh, intervention to them and similar topics in future. With all that, I thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Barthada. Absolutely fascinating talk as always. Your introspections are absolutely brilliant. Um, I actually stayed back because I thought Rito Bruto was not here, but I can see Rito is actually there with us just now. So maybe if uh, Rito takes the discussion forward thereafter. Um, is Rito Bruto there? I'm not sure. One second. I thought I saw him for a minute and then I can't see him anymore. So I'll start off in that case, Barthada. So, uh, Parthada, tell us, sir, so if you had to summarize your approach to treating pulmonary hypertension in COPD patients for the audience today, how would you summarize? How would people corroborate the echo findings with prescribing a drug to address the pulmonary hypertension in COPD patients in summary? Well, the first thing I will say a few things. First, you have to suspect pH in a COPD patient. Then you have to establish pH in a COPD patient. Then you have to decide whether you have to give treatment or not. And before that, you have to do a lot. And once you decide to treat, you have to be very careful. You have to follow a very stringent protocol. You cannot be hasty and you have to be very decisive for patients. You have to choose. It. And now I'm in the process of uh, looking at uh, who all have improved better and who, who all have not improved. Unfortunately, I don't have right heart catheterization data of all my patients. Had it been so, I could have been in a much better position to say, uh, what is the association of my uh, clinical uh, uh, exercise and radiological echocardiographic findings with right heart catheterization. But uh, what I feel that there may be a way out from this um, exercise. A lot of patients can be treated. And believe me, a lot of my patients are doing very well. And they are so happy. I'm very happy to see patients coming after three years, four years on treatment with pH. I'm not improved. Uh, recently, one patient has come. His PA pressure was uh, 60 plus systolic PA pressure, and uh, he's uh, he was stage four, uh, functional stage four. Now he's uh, moving around. He's very happy. So, um, uh, if you ask me to summarize, one should be clinically very thorough. The most important thing is nowadays everybody has a pulse oximeter. Uh, everybody should try to have a proper uh, evaluation of COPD. And to that, they should add two chair tests. Okay. Proper okay. treatment of COPD and re-evaluation with two chair tests. If there's no improvement in two chair tests, suspect pH and then evaluate for pH. Evaluate pH with echocardiography. Fix an echocardiographist. Go to him time and again. Talk to him. Decide 
that these all things you require. My, I have learned this. My echocardiographies give me a left ventricular feeling pressure, which gives me an idea about the pulmonary artery wedge pressure. And I say this pulmonary artery wedge pressure may be correct because most of the time he has given a report of more than 15 millimeters. So I am puzzled why this Bengali elderly population have got so high pulmonary artery wedge pressure. Why the left ventricle are so stiff? And why the atria, left atrial volume index is so big? They are 30, 32, 34. And uh, this may be, have some um, association with some other important disease which we have not diagnosed yet. We do not know what is the cause. That's more perplexing, more challenging to me today. And so, once he has given me that report, uh, I, I could gather some money from the government of West Bengal, uh, uh, Department of Science and Technology, uh, with which I can I could do this right heart catheterization. Now that inertia is gone, with these 55 patients, uh, overall 85 patients, I am I, I'm out of the inertia uh, that, okay, should I do or should I not do? I would definitely do in patients of uh, COPD pH with, uh, for right heart catheterization. And uh, maybe with a larger study in future, these are all small pilot observations. We can have a um, uh, sort of um, um, sort of opinion, confirmed opinion, or kind of guideline uh, uh, preaching that well, you can treat patients. This is my experience. I'm really, I'm not telling my audience to treat because there's a lot of gap. I understand the let you what I am doing and what I should have done. I could have done. I I'm not been able to do that. I want Dr. Murli Mohan to make a comment out here. Yes, yeah, sir. I was good, uh, good to say that, but I've, I've got the audience, I cannot see the audience. I mean, can we have questions put into the chat box, please, while we are just having this discussion? If people can put their questions in the chat box with your name on it, we can address it to uh, the faculty we have. So, Murli, coming to you, two comments. One is, I remember your comment about a right heart catheterization in group three patients, I mean, including the COPD patients. And the second was your approach to treatment. So disproportionate versus proportionate pulmonary hypertension in chronic hypoxia due to lung disease. A take on what uh, Parthada had to say. <laughs> so the first thing, why I've been smiling throughout is, you know, uh, Dr. Partha is so uh, modest about his achievements. I mean, you're an inspiration. I mean, what you've done is truly amazing. Uh, I only wish I could have done one tenth of that. Honestly, uh, it's amazing what you've done. Uh, the uh, one thing I'm wondering is, you know, we know that uh, point you brought out, patients who have heart disease as the primary event or associate. Okay, to dial back one, uh, we know, for example, from uh, the TORCH study and the Eclipse study that there are more people who have cardiac problems in COPD, die of cardiac problems than of respiratory problems. So it's a given that Cardiac comorbidity coexists. And the big problem right now is to tease out who has the cardiac comorbidity contributing more, who has the pulmonary uh, contributing more. And one of the things we use is what the point that you made, cardiac reserve versus respiratory reserve, or circulatory reserve versus respiratory reserve. And one of the things you do is, uh, you know, in the course of your test, if you can show that the, and this is a little more difficult because you have to look at the CO2, uh, it's not easy to get transcutaneous CO2, uh, you know, checks. Uh, but that's one way to do it. If your CO2 goes up, that means your ventilatory reserve is suffering with exercise. So you're already at the limit of ventilatory reserve. Whereas if your CO2 goes down or remains the same, that means your uh, respiratory reserve is okay. It's your circulatory reserve, which is underlying the problem. You can also do an ABG. You can do an ABG before, which for which you'll actually need an arterial catheter put in exercise the person and recheck the uh, PACO2 by doing an ABG. So that's one way to make it a little more, uh, you know, definite, which we are dealing with. The other is to do the DLCO. And, you know, if the DLCO is disproportionately low compared to the uh, other spirometric values like FEV1 and FVC, then you know that you're probably dealing with significant pulmonary hypertension, uh, which is probably arteriolar or capillary. So it's a probable precapillary but that does not rule out your post-capillary, which is often, as you were pointing out quite rightly, is the big problem we have. And it's there's no way of making out which of the two is important. Uh, so those are the feelings I have about, you know, how to tease out which is the main contributor. Uh, it's basically, you know, to use the same term that Raja used earlier, 
proportionate and out of proportion or disproportionate pulmonary hypertension. So if you get the feeling that, look, this guy's pulmonary problems as seen on uh, spirometry, as seen on a CT, do not explain this degree of pulmonary hypertension, then you have to start thinking, will such a person benefit from the um, pulmonary vasoactive medication? Try it cautiously and see if they improve, wonderful. Uh, and the cutoffs usually mentioned are if a person has an FEV1 greater than 60% predicted and an FVC greater than 70% of predicted, then it's more likely to be disproportionate. If your FEV1 is less than this or the FEC is less than 60 and 70, per, you know, then you're probably dealing with proportionate disease. So that's one way to do it. And I think we're going to have to revise a lot of these in the post-COVID era. What we're seeing is the lungs look pretty good. But the DLCO is very low. Uh, yeah. I've not done it myself. We haven't yet opened our uh, diffusion studies laboratory. But this is what uh, Sanjeev Mehta was telling us some time ago. He's been doing it regularly. Uh, and he's noticing a very, very disproportionate fall in the DLCO as compared to the um, other spirometric variables. So, so the case so, too. Let me uh, congratulate you. I mean, that's brilliant work you're doing. Sir, so your comment is also very insightful, sir. End tidal capnography would be very useful if you can have an initial and um, post exercise end tidal capnography. And it will, uh, I believe, it will reflect uh, the respiratory reserve in a much better fashion. I, I, I won't be able to do AVG. My resources are not that congenial for me. Uh, and DLC, definitely. So, so, very good suggestions. And post COVID, I'm sure that we'll find a lot of new things, a lot. The pulmonary vascular uh, problems should be far more stressed and uh, highlighted in post COVID time. Absolutely. Yeah, it's actually interestingly, Parthodan Murli, it's actually the KCO which seems to go down, I mean, dramatically Absolutely. in these patients, right? So, yeah, we're keeping the data. So, even more than the DLCO, it's the KCO which seems to be disproportionately lowered. I've got a couple of questions in the chat box which I'll ask you guys. So, okay. Parthodan, you showed the lovely diagram and where to introduce the sildenafil in your treatment algorithm. There's a question about Riosigat in class 3 pulmonary hypertension. Um, a comment about Riosigat, where would you use it if at all? See, uh, <laughs> I have not used that drug. So right. I, cannot, I cannot comment on it. But I believe that um, you have to take a principle. And if you want to use a new drug in such an indication, it has to be on a research pro protocol to start with, not just sure. a private practice. Sure. Valid comment. So, being used in class four, Murli, in CTPH, your cigar has got a license. So, what about class three? A comment from you? So, it's been shown to be useful in class one, uh, extremely useful. We had the patent study one and two. Uh, so, there it seems to work as well as the other pulmonary vasoactive medications. Class four, we all know that it's proven to be better than the others. But I think Bacitentan, for example, you're waiting for data on that in class four. The problem is class three. You know, it's never been tried. There's no evidence as far as I know. And the big problem with Riosuguat is it seems to increase the risk of pulmonary hemorrhage as compared to the other pulmonary vasoactive medications and something we have to be constantly aware of. Here are people who've got structurally damaged lungs. Uh, and I would be very hesitant to try Riosuguat in them when the other drugs seem to work just as well and haven't been implicated in this kind of problem. So I don't think they offer a special uh, benefit, except that we know that about, and this is another interesting thing that you know COPD patients have, that about 10% of patients who have, uh, between 10 and 20 in fact, who have acute exacerbations are actually the exacerbation is due to a pulmonary embolism or is associated with a pulmonary embolism. So you, that's a group you need to be aware of, apart from the left heart disease in patients with COPD, producing pulmonary hypertension. Pulmonary thromboembolic disease also may be responsible. And as I said, it's a, not a small number, 10 to 20% uh, during exacerbations. So that group, maybe we should be trying Riosuguat. That may, group may have a benefit. Right. Thanks. Thanks, Murli. Come to you, Parthuda, again. It's an interesting question, sort of out of what we have discussed. There's a question about when to think about fat embolism and how do you go about diagnosing? Well, I have to answer from, um, from my small experience and my theory. So fat embolism doesn't go, uh, doesn't happen automatically. There has to be some risk factor, some trauma, some surgery, something. 
um, going before the embolic event. <clears throat> and the patient's presentations are also different. I remember one patient who happened to be diagnosed, who happened to have a diagnosis of traumatic fat embolism post-mortem when I was a junior resident. This patient was uh, brought in after um, uh, he was uh, being involved in a street fight. And he was traumatized at multiple sites. He was hospitalized and in the hospital, he had uh, delirium and he had um, uh, a lot of petition in his uh, abdomen and other uh, parts of the body. And he died within 24 to 48 hours of severe hypoxemia. He was suspected to have traumatic fat embolism and um, he was given treatment including heparin and moxy and whatever steroid, but ultimately he succumbed. And postmortem showed uh, fat emboli in the microvasculature of the brain. So the presentation may not be just like your um, uh, sure. uh, pulmonary embolism clot. It is absolutely different. And um, we have to have a very strong suspicion. <clears throat> Murli, anything to add to what uh, Parthada said? I think that is perfect. They yeah. come in with systemic and pulmonary emboli uh, features. Uh, they tend to be confused. Uh, if you do a, as, as Dr. Partha was saying, you know, they'll have petechiae. That's one of the giveaways in the appropriate clinical setting. And, you know, something that we are probably going to see more of is if people do liposuction, for example, that's a big, big culprit for uh, sure. fat embolism. Fat and of course, you can get amniotic fluid emboli, which sometimes have very similar features. And the conjunctive are classic, isn't it? I mean, the petechiae you have to look for in the conjunctive. I sort of remember my sort of MCQ. Everywhere. Yeah, everywhere. Yeah, everywhere. Yeah, correct. Like correct. Um, I, there's a couple of questions which are outside the ambit of pulmonary hypertension. So I will leave those questions. I'm sorry. I think we have also run out of time. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed doing that. Uh, Parthada, thanks for the opportunity. I'm grateful to you. And Best also to Dr. Moldi Mohan. My yeah, so, well. yeah. So, Murli, thank you very much. It's always a pleasure Bye, yeah. to see you from my side. And I hand over to Parthada for the concluding comments. And before before you, you start, Dr. Partha, Raja, as usual, brilliant. Uh, you don't need to say that. <laughs> uh, Dr. Partha, I was absolutely impressed with what you're doing. And, and, you know, more strength to you. I wish you come out with more and more papers in this area uh, and all the other areas you're working in, ILD and so on. So uh, this was a huge learning experience for me. Uh, and I'm looking forward to searching your papers and trying to see if we can get some data yeah, from our side also. It's a very Thank small you. paper, it's very silly papers. Oh, well, no, 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 no. It's, <laughs> it's original work, which is always to be appreciated. Uh, I, it is my pleasure to interact with you always. And I feel that from now onwards, whatever small I do, I will first communicate with you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much for attending and uh, gracing our PalmoCon. I hope that we'll meet again and again. Uh, I am um, keen to make one more session um, for pulmonary thromboembolism and pulmonary thromboembolism related pulmonary problems. So in that also, I might ask you to kindly be our guest uh, faculty. I, thank you, sir. And Raja, I'm grateful to you. As usual, you have been always ready to help me. Whenever I say, Raja, you have to do this, Raja is <laughs> always ready. Thanks, Rito Bruto. I, I thank all my audience. And if I make that uh, two chair test as a um, uh, topic in Palmocon, it may be in, in, in a weekdays. So I'll let you know before that. Thank you very much. Thanks to everyone. Bye. Good night. Thank you, sir.